All right, guys, Tyler down here at Emerald City Guitars with my pick of the day, uh, this very early 1952 uh, Gibson Les Paul. Now, uh, this is a very early example of one of the first commercially successful solid body electric guitars. So when we talk about early electric guitars, there's uh, quite a bit of misinformation floating around, a lot of sort of gray area. So before we talk about this guitar specifically, uh, let's go into a little bit of that. So attempts to amplify string instruments go back as far as uh, right around the turn of the 20th century. Basically, as soon as telephones became commercially available, people were taking the voice transducers out of the receivers and trying to pick up signal on early banjos and mandolins. Um, this did not really work. The transducers were just too weak at the time. That is until about 1935, when a number of companies uh, started releasing electric guitars with viable pickups. Now, almost all of these were just hollow body guitars that had been adapted with electronics, but there were a few companies that released solid body electric guitar designs. The names that come up when we talk about this period are, you know, Rickenbacker, Vivitone, and Slingerland are the three big ones. Now, technically, they did make the first solid body electric guitars, but they really weren't much more than lap steel guitars with round necks. They didn't really resemble what we now think of as, uh, as modern electric guitars. And now where things start to get really interesting for the solid body electric guitar uh, is right around 1948 in Southern California. So we're just out of the war. Uh, economy's great. The music is fantastic, especially in Southern California, where we have Paul Bigsby in Downey, California, Leo Fender, of course, in Fullerton. Uh, Rickenbacker at the time was headquartered in Los Angeles proper, and uh, Les Paul at the time was living in Hollywood. Now these four names are basically like the Mount Rushmore of early solid body electric guitars. They all lived in the LA area, basically in each other's backyards. So they all knew each other, they all hung out, and though they were competitors, they'd occasionally bounce ideas off each other. So the first modern solid body electric guitar actually came out of the shop of Paul Bigsby in 1948. It was one that he built for country star Merle Travis, who at that point was pretty much the biggest guitar hero out there. Uh, he played the guitar out a lot, the word got out, and everyone needed a solid body electric guitar. And within two years, Leo Fender had prototyped and released his solid body guitar design, uh, the Broadcaster. Uh, of course, this was very, very successful, and in another two years, by 52, uh, Gibson had to jump on board as well, and they did so with the Les Paul model, an endorsement from their own uh, guitar hero of sorts. So the following year, Gretsch would release their first solid body guitar, virtually identical in shape to the Les Paul, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. But back to this guitar, uh, very early 1952, and uh, there are a few features that uh, distinguish these from the later 52 models. Uh, the first of which, on this lead pickup, as you can see, it's a regular P90, but the mounting holes are distinctly different uh, from the ones we're used to seeing. You can see it's still mounted with two screws, but uh, rather than in line with the pull pieces, they're on opposite diagonal corners, which is something you'll pretty much only see in very early 52. So if you look at the back of the headstock on this guitar, uh, you'll notice the complete absence of a serial number, uh, which is not unusual for these early models. Uh, another missing feature that we'd expect to see was binding on the neck. That wouldn't come until later in 52. Uh, you'll also notice that there is no rhythm treble switch plate, uh, like we'll see on pretty much all Les Pauls, though it didn't come until a little bit later. Up on the headstock, if we take a look at the Gibson logo, we'll see that the dot on top of the eye is actually connected to the upper part of the G, which is only something we see on pretty early models. We of course have the very early no name, no hole Klusen tuners. So one feature on these early Les Pauls that a lot of players seem to uh, have issue with is the tailpiece. As you can see, if you look closely, the strings wrap under the tailpiece rather than over like we're used to seeing. And uh, quite frankly, it makes it very difficult to play um, as you'll soon hear. So the neck sets on these early 52s were so shallow that you can't just bolt on, you know, a wrap over the top tailpiece or a tunematic or some other bridge like that to solve this problem. That was until very recently when a company, I believe it's called Mojo Axe, they actually manufacture a compensated replacement tailpiece that sits down low enough to wrap the strings over the top uh, without having to change this neck angle at all. We were considering getting one for this guitar at the shop just to make it a little bit easier to play. But we decided for the time being to just keep the guitar original, uh, try to play it how it is, and uh, let the new owner decide what they want to do with it. But it is very difficult to play and uh, that's the reason that these 52s and early 53s are a lot more affordable than the later gold tops. So Gibson caught onto this issue pretty early on, and in 1953 they 
uh, increased the neck angle just slightly and added the wrap over the top tailpiece, although the adjustability still wasn't quite there. Uh, the neck angle was increased slightly in 1954 uh, and then a great deal in 1955 once the Tunematic was introduced, which of course uh, still remains to this day on just about every Les Paul that you'll see. And just overall, the guitar's in great shape. This top looks fantastic. Lots of times on these gold tops, when they start to wear, uh, you'll see them get really green around the edges and it kind of looks nasty, but this one's still totally vibrant gold, uh, just beautiful. All right, so I'm gonna attempt to play it for you now. Even though you can't really get your hand down on top of the strings, you almost kind of have to float over, so hopefully you get a good idea of how it sounds. Uh, today we're playing through this matching 1954 GA20 uh, Les Paul amp. This is a rig that's been together for a lot of years, but um, yeah, let's plug it in. You can hear it for yourself. So there we have it, very early 1952 Gibson Les Paul through the matching GA20 amp down here at Emerald City Guitars. Come on down, check them both out for yourself. We'll see you next time.